Hi, I'm Kristen Tetsi, author of The Age of the Child. Hi, I'm Isabel, and I am the founder and firebrand of The Uprising Spark. Hi, I'm Lenora. I'm the creator of The Bitchy Bookkeeper, and we are the three founding non-mothers of Child Free Girls. In this episode, we are going to be discussing antinatalism, or antinatalism, which is a philosophical position that assigns a negative value to birth. And today we have a very special guest, Amanda, who has been a part of the antinatalist community for 10 years now? Is that yeah, correct? just about. Yeah. Okay, and she has also created a short film called The Ethelist, which is available on YouTube now to watch, and we'll be including, there's a link down below which you guys can watch, which we highly recommend. So we'll start off first with, Amanda, you can tell us what exactly antinatalism is and get into ethelism and explain how, how those are connected. Sure. Okay. So antinatalism essentially at its, at its core is uh, basically saying that procreation is unethical. Um, and it, more than anything, the basis for why it is unethical is because is the belief essentially that life creates suffering. It creates lots of other things too. Life is not just suffering. There's all kinds of experiences in life. It's a big medley of all types of experiences, but it's the suffering that has all of this value weight. And essentially, uh, we are the products of a system that was broken from the beginning. DNA didn't go to school <laughs> as far as, you know, how to create life, how to create happy life forms, how to create life forms that don't suffer. Um, it's just this sort of accident of biology that happened, you know, without a whole lot of explanation. Um, and it doesn't care. It doesn't care what we go through. It doesn't care how much we suffer. Um, and there really just isn't any reason to keep perpetuating this bad program. Um, you know, we as living things, we need life to be so many things. We need it to be good. We need it to be, uh, we need, we need, we have so much need out of, out of what we need to get out of it. Um, but when it comes to keeping that going, you know, creating more life, um, then it becomes an imposition that I don't really think can be warranted. We shouldn't really have the right to create more hunger, more thirst, more need. Uh, there's already so much need in the world. We really shouldn't have the right, essentially, to create more suffering. Um, so antinatalism is this idea that's been around for a tremendously long period of time in the world, in one form or another. Uh, but it was really only in 2006 that the, t the, the term was coined as a philosophical term, sort of, um, interestingly enough, uh, sort of at the same time, uh, somebody by the name of David Benatar, who's a South African philosopher, coined it, and also the Belgium writer, uh, Theophile de Guerreau. They seem to have kind of come up with it, <laughs> both of them together, uh, but separately. Um, Ethelism didn't really show up until 2010, 2011. It, is the, uh, it was a term that was coined by the YouTube-based philosopher in Mendham. Ethel is life spelled backwards. Um, and really the need for Ethelism sort of came up because the vast, historically, and the vast majority of antinatalism deals with human life. Um, it, it basically says, you know, human life is this failed science experiment. Um, it should go extinct but it didn't account for the rest of sentient life, all, this other, all these other life forms on the planet that also suffer horrifically. So ethelism applies to all life. Yeah, I think that's the bare bones of it. Yeah. Wow. So you are an ethelist? Yeah. Do you, okay. And can we ask, so what, what uh, made you, what brought this on for you? What was your, what's your journey with antinatalism and then specifically ethelism? Sure. I mean, uh, you know, most of my life, I would say, before I found any of this, it was like, I didn't necessarily not want kids. I didn't necessarily want them. I was, it was sort of a blasé idea that could, I mean, I, there was a time in my life where like, I could have happened. I could have, I could have fallen into it as I think a lot of people just do. You know, they're not thinking, you know, so the majority of people that are on this planet are the products of people who didn't think about it particularly hard. <laughs> and so yeah. could I have fallen into that? Maybe, you know. Um, 
And, uh, and so, but then I, so I'd been making YouTube videos for a couple of years prior. I was a toy reviewer. So I was making Dragon Ball toy oh. reviews uh, and putting on crazy costumes and scaring the hell out of people. And, uh, and so I was in that part of YouTube. And then all of a sudden I just sort of, you know, I like weird content. I like interesting content. And I, I stumbled upon uh, people like Lamenda and people like Derived Energy who were talking about these concepts. And I just honestly found it so inspiring. Um, because it was this, I've, I've referred to antinatalism like this in the past. It's just this unbelievable, despite how old it is as an idea, it's this incredibly under chewed on piece of intellectual gristle. It's like, it, it's just so under appreciated and so under thought through and, and produced. Um, and so as an artist, I just like, I couldn't help but just be so ignited by it. Um, and so, yeah, just since that point, I just have kind of, I've just basically been producing antinatalist content in one way or another, um, for like 10 years now. So aside from the movie, um, you know, I run a contest every year, uh, where people can make their first antinatalist video, sort of explaining why they are an antinatalist. Um, I do the news, I do this thing called antinatal news on, on, uh, different platforms like uh, Twitter. Um, and it basically just done my best to kind of chart the way that this idea is forming and growing and changing in the world. That's actually neat. This is not really a, a question. It's more of a comment. That's, that's actually inspiring. Just, uh, I think it's how I stumbled upon the child free community. You're kind of going, yeah. you're not, you don't have a word for it, but you see something that speaks to yeah. you and suddenly it's like a light bulb or a fire gets lit inside of you. And it's like, Hey, <laughs> this kind well, of explains absolutely. a lot. Did you yeah. did you find that it that discovering antinatalism and, and even just the content did it kind of help your 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 life your your daily life just kind of where you belong in the sense of living or yeah I think it did honestly um, because I think that there was I think for a, a tremendous number of us there's just so much about the way we live our lives that's just sort of this amorphous soup of like nobody's really guiding us you know through ethics I mean who talks about ethics. Um, and so it did kind of, um, you know, I did become a vegan because of my antinatalist convictions. Um, I did sort of like, uh, anti modern antinatalism and specifically ethalism too is very geared towards, um, atheism. So it put, it connected a lot of dots for me as far as all of that goes as well. Um, yeah. And it just, it did sort of solidify what was in me so for so long um just kind of all over the place wishy-washy uh and that you know i mean that was all a process of you know like like i said 10 years i mean it didn't happen overnight um in fact when i was first exposed to all this stuff i didn't make my first antinatalism video for a full year because i really wanted to like you know think about it and make sure this wasn't you know just product of an excited mind <laughs> um you know so yeah Oh, it did. It gets given me a lot. Now, is all antinatalism a philosophy that trends toward, ideally toward um, extinction or just, well, I guess if you're an ethalist, that would be the goal, right? Is just yeah. extinction of sentient life? Right. Um, okay. Sorry, I, I do have a tendency to interrupt, so just tell me. I'm no, me too. So go slap ahead. me across the face <laughs> if I do that. Um, I, it depends on who you talk to as far as antinatalism proper goes. Uh, you know, some feel that it, uh, it doesn't have to be about, uh, it can be about population reduction through an act of anti, you know, lack of procreation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's essentially a, a, um, a diagnosis of life that it's not doing anything of, um, that it's not really doing anything of value and that it should end. Okay. And what, uh, what qualifies as suffering? Uh, I mean, suffering, anything that qualifies as suffering. I mean, suffering comes in an unbelievable multitude of forms in this life. It can be horrific physical pain. It can be horrific mental anguish. Um, so horrific generally, not not like any unpleasant emotion or any unpleasant experience. We're talking actual suffering or any Well, it, it depends on what, what we're qualifying as just a regular, you know, plain old. Uh, I don't think that, that there's any, I don't think that life is doing anything significant to justify a pinprick. I really don't. 
I don't think that it's personally, I don't think that it's doing anything to justify any amount of suffering, okay. but we, ha you know, we have the privilege in our lives of, 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 uh, experiencing suffering on this in this great gradient right i mean there's there's there are the pinpricks and then there are the genocides mm -hmm. and the fact of the matter is none of us exist in our happy fairly privileged relatively non-suffering lives without all this other shit go oh, sorry i don't know if i'm allowed to swear uh, yeah, without yeah. all this other stuff happening you know it's it, we're not experiencing life in a vacuum in, as individuals we 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 are all experiencing life and it to extract our pleasures out of life somebody else has is paying that price you know what i mean i'm sitting you know we're all sitting here in front of nice computers you know having this this very intelligent you know uh, conversation about what life is and what should happen to it while people are basically slaving to create these computers you know and so it's it's uh yeah so there's there's no way of, of, of escaping that gradient, even if you yourself are not experiencing necessarily the worst of it. You probably on some level are, are, the, are causing it. Uh, we don't get out of the victim or aggressor. Uh, there's no way of escaping the two sides of that, that coin, either one or the other. And, you know, we are pretty young. Uh, we haven't experienced the worst of what life has. We haven't, there's this whole, this is, Thing called death hanging above our heads um so it's very easy i think for a lot of us to write the product review uh, of life in the middle of our addictions so to speak you know when we can have this enjoyment of it but it's not really the full story and is that at all a cultural idea though because there are some cultures that don't think about death the same way we do they don't they don't treat it as a either a taboo thing to talk about or as a tragedy to fear um, and then I also wondered, kind of in conjunction with that, just because I'm talking about cultural, the, the cultural aspect of something like this, because it relates to suffering, um, and I, I don't know that animals, I mean, I guess animals cause each other suffering, but um, I guess that could also be chalked up to their their own food chain they're not you know they're not doing the same harm humans are doing hum, you know humans are enslaving other humans i mean humans are doing absolutely terrible things to other humans and like you in the name of things like giving us computers but if there could if there were ever possibly a way for human civilization to operate more like say a tribe in botswana that basically lives off fruits and nuts um would that like if we we're better. <laughs> we were just better people if we learned to exist in a way that was less destructive, less cruel. Um, do you think antinatalism would still be necessary? Well, I want life to be better. Let me just say, start. I mean, there was a number of questions there, so let me I know, make I'm sure sorry. I'm getting to No, 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 not at all, not at all. I just want to make sure I'm getting to everything. I th let me, well, I think the first thing that you asked was about, you know, death in different cultures. I think we can put all kinds of pearls on the giant pig of death and call it, you know, this beautiful thing. Um, not beautiful. Just, not I, just I don't, I think dying sucks in all cultures. I think, I think the pain of leaving this world is not fun <laughs> or not a good experience, no matter where in the world you are. Um, we may have different ways of dealing with that, but, the bottom line is why create a new human life to experience that everything that we build in this lifetime, all of the, all of this individuality and the things that we create and our ambitions are completely humiliated and destroyed by sickness. I mean, the process of, of death, not, you know, death we can argue is or is not a hard, I think it is. Um, but the, the road to getting there is pretty nasty. Um, so I, I think that, yes, there are definitely cultures that deal with it a lot better than ours. Um, but I get the, the road there, the process of dying is pretty nasty across the board. That is just a sentient, um, part of the sentient condition, I think. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, I always kind of, well, my friend in Mendham always kind of, uh, lays this out of like, you know, okay, you have antinatalism as a sort of plan A, you know what I mean? But the plan B is to sort of these societal fixes, like how do you make the world a better place? How do you make it more livable for all of the living things in it? Um, and so if yes, if you could create a world 
where, you know, human beings weren't doing terrible things and human beings weren't doing, uh, weren't eating other animals and whatnot. Um, that'd be great, <laughs> but I don't, I, first of all, I don't see that happening. Uh, I don't see it happen without society collapsing and, you know, a, a small number of people that want to do the right thing doing some nice things. Um, and I still think that the, the, the real, the real criminal here is not really human beings. It is nature. There is more suffering in nature um, than there is in the human world. Human beings are awful. Don't get me wrong. Human beings are responsible for terrible things in this world. But it is nature that's the real culprit. It is nature that predation, uh, everything that happens in nature is where the suffering really is. It is where the vast majority of suffering lives on this planet. Well, I'm, I'm just, you know, wondering one thing, because I mean, you talk about suffering and, and like, I understand where your idea is coming from, but I can't stop thinking about human interaction and I'm like positive mm -hmm. human interaction. So isn't there any value on that? Sure. We're doing it right now. I, I mean, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't make people understand this or at least have this conversation without the value of how great it is that we have this ability to have language and have conversation. So like I said in the very beginning, life is all kinds of things. You know, it's all kinds of experiences. You know, I, I am a toy collector. <laughs> I am an artist. I love a lot of just stupid stuff, you know, and I, and I have, and I see great personal value in that, you know, um, I love a lot of things about life, you know, but I, again, it's, what is it, what is, what is the, the price of all of that, you know, and, and I don't think that it's worth the price. And I definitely don't, as a living thing, you know, I, I I'm kind of forced to pay that price. I'm sort of a forced to be a, 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 a pawn in the bad program. Um, but signing somebody else up <laughs> to play that game, uh, I don't think is, I don't think it'd be can be justified. So what does the anti-nihilist movement or the people who are part of this movement, what, what do you guys do in terms of putting your word out there? What do you want to achieve with your message? Well, I think that unfortunately, <laughs> we're still very young as a movement. And the vast majority, this is just the truth, the vast majority of, of people that call themselves anti-nihilist, epilists, are not particularly at the point where they're brave enough to um, be as vocal as I think we need to be. Um, so, you know, it's a real phenomenon. One of my, uh, one of the things I do in the antinatalist community is I'm also sort of the archivist. So um, it's, re it's a real phenomenon that the vast majority of people who end up, who make a video, let's say, expressing their antinatalist beliefs, take down their video because they're scared. They don't know what the cost of, in their lives, that's, it's going to do because nobody talks about these things. Um, and, and nobody really knows how to deal with it. So things like traditional activism, like marches, like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, we don't do that. I hope that we'll get to the point of doing that at some point. Um, but I think that the vast majority of people that do engage in antinatalist activism, such as it is, that's really a, um, it's a, it's a wheel that we, sort of unfortunately have to create because nobody's really done it before. What does antinatalist activism look like? I mean, that's literally a, a, a Lego set that we are writing the instructions for at the minute. Um, so I think art is real important. I think it's an excellent, uh, there aren't, there haven't really been very many antinatalist artists in the world. It's a very unexpressed opinion in the form of art. Um, and, and I think just talking, you know, putting it in people's brain, it's not, it's not, you know, It's not so much, I think the onus needs to be taken away a little bit, at least from convincing people and making people anti-natalist. It's just, it's just having the conversation. And I think that's the most important thing that needs to happen right now. Um, you know, aside from that, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where it has the possibility to go. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I mean, I, I watched a couple of episodes of, uh, of this podcast, previous podcast episodes. Um, And I think that the I think that the idea of you know ending subsidies for uh, for people with children I think that's a very important thing that needs to happen. I think antinatalism I think anti procreative people of all kinds need to be a voice um, in elder care. 
um, in child care. Uh, I think we need to take care of people. And I think that all the old rules of how you take care of people like the elderly has to be rewritten so that people don't have to have this idea in their head that they need to produce people in order to take care of them. So there's all kinds of societal things that I think we really can be a very important uh, modernizing voice for. So, yeah, I hope that answers it. And um, just curious, what is the most radical idea that you have either conceived or heard within your movement to, you know, what we are right now? The, the oh. <laughs> uh, well, um, so the most radical idea, well, there's all kinds of radical ideas that I don't, I don't take seriously at all. There's all kinds of radical ideas that people think are what antinatalism or ethalism is, that it isn't. Um, you know, when you, when you get into conversations about how you deal with nature or how, you know, human beings a little easier to like, we're just not going to procreate and we'll go extinct. I mean, that's, that's a little bit, but how you deal with animal life. Um, the bottom line is, you know, essentially that I'm probably saying it wrong, like the Hippocratic oath that doctors take, you know, do no harm. So how do you end life on planet earth ethically? What does ethical extinction look like? And again, that is a Lego set with no instructions. You know what I mean? Um, and so I don't know. I, you know, I don't necessarily know. Can we sterilize animals? And would that, would that cause them a tremendous amount of suffering or, or wouldn't? I, do, I, I, I think that again, the, the, what antinatalists and ethalists that are uh, extinction minded, you know, are saying is that we'd like the human race in a more, uh, in a wider context to have that conversation of what that would look like, because we don't want, uh, we don't want some, you know, it would be really easy to destroy life if we were okay with uh, brutal, uh, violent methods. And I, we don't want that. That's not what we're, ad we're advocating. We want to figure out what, what would ethical extinction look like. So there is the uh, probably the most famous uh, controversial idea in antinatalism or ethalism, specifically ethalism, is the red button thought experiment, which is not didn't really originate with ethalism, but it's if you had a, the red button in your hand and if you pressed it, life would just poof. You know, no suffering, no, you know, no nothing bad happening to anybody. It would it would you know would you press it if everything could just go away? Literally, the universe is unplugged. And a lot of uh, antinatalists, nephilists, myself included, would say, yeah, I would. Um, however, I completely admit that in doing so, you would be violating the social contract. You'd be violating consent. So it's not a particularly ethical solution, um, but it's a thought experiment. It's not a plan. <laughs> it's a thought experiment. It's a would, would you know, would that, would that be something that you would do? Um, and I think it does kind of show the, you know, the emergency that life is. Yeah. Please sit tight. We are about to show you a short clip from the Ethelis movie. Once in a castle long ago, there lived Dr. Frankenstein. The doctor was an evil, sadistic shithead of a fucktard who delighted in creating and imposing life on as many beings as possible. Must populate! In his lab, the doctor had two powerful buttons, one big green button and one big red button. Dr. Frankenstein never pressed the red button because it was the big red button, capable of ending all existence in the universe instantaneously. Why is this even here? But Dr. Frankenstein loved his big green button, for whenever it was pressed, it allowed him to create strong, healthy, and beautiful creatures who were the happiest people the world had ever known. However, for every ten of these stupid happy creatures, a Frankenstein monster was born. Oh, life sucks. Hideous, diseased, blighted with a thousand horrors, miserable. Oh, fuck. Out, out, out. 
and banished. The link to the full Ethelist movie is in the description below. So I have a question that came to me from uh, one of my one of my followers who is child free. She's young, yeah. and uh, she's newly discovered child free and realizing that she didn't want to have children. And she's just kind of grappling with living in a pronatalist world as a young child free woman. Mm-hmm. So she wanted me to ask you, how is it? How um. How are you, how do you handle being an antinatalist in a pronatalist world? Because we've got commercials, we've got everything geared towards, you know, procreation. So just, and, and you've, you have given a lot of good examples, like you use your art and you're finding ways to express it. But like on a, on a daily basis, is there anything else that you do to survive like a decent existence in this, this kind right. of environment that we live in? Yeah. You gotta, you gotta put on your bravery helmet. That's for sure. I mean, um, so I, I think that the, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have a, a great answer for this, to be perfectly honest with you. It's a great question. I, I, I don't mean it like that. But I, um, I would say that you got to start a little bit small. You, you got to kind of like look at your ability to live in the world as an antinatal person. You know, punch yourself in the stomach little bits by bits to sort of you know, tough in your stomach muscles, so to speak, metaphorically. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm not afraid. I mean, that's just the bottom line is I don't really, I don't really care if people don't like me because of it. Um, and I think that a lot of people do worry about that. They worry about what it's going to mean as far as their relationship with their families. That's a big one. Uh, what it's going to mean for their friendships, what it's going to mean about all kinds of things, all the ways that they interact with the world. Um, when I was in graduate school, um, my entire thesis was about antinatalism and ethylism. So I literally spent two years just talking to people about this pretty much and making the ethylis. Um, and so that, you know, and I, I, and so I like, I can't hide it even if I wanted to at this point. Like I, I was also, I was a guest on the show Tosh.0 because a part of the movie went viral. So it's like, I, I, I can't get away from it. And I, I honestly like, I, um, I'm very proud of it, if you want to know the truth. I mean, I know you're not supposed to benefit from your activism personally, and uh, but I don't. I also think that when you're an activist for a topic that's sort of like under the radar as antinatalism, you're 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 not going to be able to do both. You're not going to be able to not gain from it a little bit, so to speak, um, and be able to deliver the message. I think it's a. I think it's something that people really need to hear. I think it's a really vital uh, idea in the world. Um, and so I, 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 I want people to sort of have that attitude a little bit more. I want people to be proud of their antinatalism or their child free ism, um, their anti procreative stance. Um, I think people should be proud of it because it does take an incredible amount of undoing <laughs> what you've been told and what you've been taught. It, it really is sort of a battlefield that we all have been on. Um, to dismantle in ourselves and stand uh, away from, you know, all these things that we have been, uh, that the rest of the world has been sort of polluted with, essentially. So um, it's not easy. And and especially if people are, you know, if you have any kind of social anxiety or whatnot, I'm completely sympathetic to that. Um, But take it a little bit at a time. Don't necessarily think that you have to have all these huge conversations with people and convince them of anything just be proud of it you know do what you can to um to talk about it with people in any way shape or form uh try not to and this is a tough one but i mean try not to devolve into hatred of the other side to the point uh, because i think a lot of people do fall into that um to where you lose the plot essentially this is about um changing the memes in society and it can't happen without your voice. Um, it, it can't happen without you saying the words. So uh, patience. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. The the traveling into the hatred is something I'm, I was curious about because if you, I've been following a few antinatalists on Twitter and I've noticed that it's very depressing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very angry. Yeah. And it got me wondering about um, about whether 
not whether antinatalists begin as unhappy people, but whether going moving into antinatalism has a tendency to create a period at least of unhappiness because because going into this means you're doing research into it. And doing research into it means you're hearing all of these messages of the suffering caused by people, all of the suffering but just all over. And that's a heavy, a heavy thing to carry with you every day. And you know, so you think I'm going to enjoy, uh, Jesus, it could even be an apricot. I mean, who knows? Sure. There are studies that show there was a study I read about with, um, two trees placed side by side and the scientist came in and he hacked one of the trees up with a machete and the other tree was hooked up to electrodes. <clears throat> the guy who did it left. And then one by one, different people came in and one of those people caused the electrodes to I don't know if this is a, I don't remember, it was so many years ago, I don't remember if it was used for fictional purposes or if it was real, Mm -hmm. but I think a lot of studies have showed that um, there is some sort of sense in the world beyond humans and beyond other sentient life that we call sentient anyway. And we don't even know, I mean, to even think that our capacity for understanding this planet, this universe, this vast infinite universe to think that we have even an iota of the ability to understand as much as we think we understand is I think the height of arrogance. I mean, there are people who see colors we can't see. There are colors we can't see. So if there's, there could be this whole realm of existence or understanding or anything that we have absolutely no way of measuring or even acknowledging. So knowing that, we could be ca- causing suffering just just by walking on grass. And if you go that far, or even not that far, I think it's just, it could be hard getting into this to live a day-to-day life without thinking, my computer was built by little little child laborers. Um, this diamond I'm wearing was probably pulled out of a cave by a slave. I mean, everything has potential to cause suffering. So did you, when you got into this, did you notice whether there was a period of adjustment where you were just really down or or even angry yourself and that you had to you know almost become desensitized or at least cope with it before you could say okay I'm going to create a balance I'm going to learn how to actively promote this idea without becoming absolutely consumed by it and just utterly depressed well uh speaking to the first part of what you said which was um had to do with I'm trying to remember the first thing you said now. You sorry, know, like all the people who are like on Twitter who are angry. Oh yes, yes, yes. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I will. I will say that I think the the hatred and the anger and the misanthropy is a problem across the board with with anti procreative people. I, that is not to generalize. Obviously, like there's wonderful people like yourselves in the child free world. Uh, there's wonderful people in the antenatal world, Ethel world, the vehement world, absolutely. But there's a whole lot of like baby hate and uh, parental hate that is so unproductive <laughs> and so besides the point of anything that any of us are trying to do. Um, and I, I think it's, I think it really is an itis of our anti-procreative world across the board that we do need to address uh, a lot. Um, and I have, I've tried to address it in various ways and people don't like it very much because they want to, their freedom to hate the children and whatnot. Um, I think people are free to dislike, hate, whatever they want. But again, you know, speaking to my, something my friend in Mendham says, there is a, a real difference between psychology and philosophy. So we can have our psychologies, we can have our hatreds, we can have our individual bigotries and whatnot. That's fine, but when we're doing philosophy or when we're trying to uh, really say something about the world, let's let's be philosophers and a little bit more um, uh, reasonable <laughs> at the very least. So, uh, so I, I do think that you know what you're seeing there. Yeah, I don't I I don't condone it whatsoever, and I don't like it, and I think it needs to change big time. Um, yeah, I do I do absolutely. I think there are some people who are destroyed by this. I do. Uh, and I don't know that they come back from it. Um, it's not that I don't understand. It's it's very different than my experience of it. Because I, I 
heard about all this stuff and I, and I, you know, I, I was clued into all this stuff and I just, it made me want to like go, <laughs> you know, it made me want to create, uh, you know, it became the baby I'm not having, you know what I mean? It, it, it became this creative exercise for me. Uh, and I know I'm kind of a minority in that. Um, I don't think that it has to destroy anyone's life. I really, really don't. Um, I just think that the, the underpinnings that, you know, I mean, people do kind of, they're from the time we're tiny little kids, we're told this is going to be life. This is, you know, children in your future. This is what to expect. This is what to work for. Uh, life is good. You know, all of these things. Um, and when all of that is kind of taken away, you have to expect that it's going to completely screw people up. Um, I don't think I really went through any period of like of that personally, but I know people do. And I think especially when people try to, this is where I think people have to be a little bit careful too about who they talk to when they're in the early phases of their antinatalism, let's say, or whatever anti-appropriative type you might be. Um, don't necessarily talk to your parents <laughs> first thing. Uh, Cause I, I, a lot of people have had that experience that I've talked to anyway. It's like, they, they read about antinatalism online and then they run to their mommies and they're like, I, I was imposed upon, you shouldn't have done, you know, and it's, and they have a very emotional reaction. And then the parent gets complete, you know, just basically, I'm, I've had experiences of people's parents telling them to kill themselves. Um, so a lot, I mean, that happens a lot because people there, you know, prior generations who have, who have procreated, some of those people, and again, I'm not trying to generalize, but some of those people don't see the point to living without having done all this. You know, they can't conceive of, of, of what life is without having kids and all this. So um, I just, I mean, as cheesy as it sounds, I think we need to be there for each other more. I think we do need to create a more, a wider child-free antenatal world where people have something, to, you know, people to fall back on. Um, and you know, I know people, are, I don't mean a, a circle jerk kind of environment. I'm just saying like, it needs its, uh, it needs its churches, so to speak. It needs, it needs places. People that believe these things are very alone and we need people to be able to talk to. We need places to go. We need it to be more normalized in the world. Uh, and without that, um, without that, I think, I think, yeah, I think it is really hard for a lot of people because some people are very isolated. Um, yeah. Um, we talk about, okay, you, you bring up your creation, your creative process and how you are rare about that. And the three of us, we have created, we are creative types as well. Yeah. And we stand by that. We want to encourage people to use art, whatever form that they, they use or are comfortable with to express themselves and create something wherever they are in their journey. We, we really encourage that. So is there anything from, okay, an antinatalist point of view that you would, that you could say, hey, maybe start with this to kind of get their creative juices flowing if maybe they're not that creative and they go, well, I don't know how to do anything. I can't paint. I can't do videos. Right. But they want they want to express themselves in a way that that's safe and maybe to their small social circle. Like We want to encourage that. So is there anything you can yeah. say to them? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, start with... I, I, th I honestly think writing is one of the best ways of, of going in. You know, um, maybe don't necessarily... I mean, Yes, it'd be, it, there are some wonderful people in like, you know, you can join Facebook groups and Twitter or whatever and all that and talk to people about it. But um, I think I benefited a lot from having a more solitary, just sort of watching experience, like in my first year of being an antinatalist where I didn't really, again, I was watching things, but I wasn't really communicating with anybody. And um, I, I would really love to hear from people that, you know, really expected to be parents. I think that voice of like the would be mother, the would be father, is really like missing, especially from, I, I don't know as much from like the child free world. I, I just don't, but from the child, from the antinatalist world, I feel like those voices are not necessarily as welcome, but they're very needed. You know, what lives did people expect to have? Um, Cause I think it's, it is, in my opinion, it's okay to like have wanted that kind of life and to have come to another kind of understanding. So I think like, I don't know, as far as a creative endeavor, like maybe just writing about what that, uh, yeah, what that process has been like for that particular person. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and really like it, it can take a while, but sort of finding the right people to talk to about all this, uh, you know, in, in the current 
you know, groups that we have set up, um, I think could be a good thing. Is there a um, antinatalist uh, community online? One, you know, I, I know that in the child free online communities, there are some that are particularly vitriolic and yeah. nasty. And then there are some that are really supportive and, and upbeat and positive, not supportive, but positive. Uh, they don't go for words like breeder and crotch food and all that bullshit. Yeah. Sprog. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the antinatalist community, is there a forum or a particular place where people new to this or even who just feel isolated in their antinatalism or even ethalism, is there a place they can go that is friendly? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> it's a... I think you're going to get a mixed bag anyway. I mean, I'm just being honest. I think it's going to be a little bit of a mixed bag. I can definitely link you. Like there's the, the main sort of antinatalist Facebook group is it's, it's got some great moderators. I mean, it's, it's a good, there's some really great people there. Um, I run a discord called Rogue philosophy, which is a great place. Um, I definitely welcome anybody and everybody that would like to uh, come join us there. It is, it welcomes, you know, uh, anti-procreative types of all kinds. Um, I'm not going to say that nothing bad is ever going to happen as far as, you know, trolls and people that are just, you know, be jerks about things. But, um, what was it called again? You know, rogue philosophy, rogue, rogue philosophy, philosophy. antinatalism. Okay. Yeah. Well, that is all for this episode. Thank you very much, Amanda, for joining us in this discussion or letting us listen to you because this was fabulous. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm very worried. No, this is, this is, we're all wordy. So it's nice to actually listen <laughs> to uh, something that actually we don't really know a lot about. So this was awesome. So we hope that you out there have enjoyed this conversation. We have linked the video that we encourage you to watch. The Ephelis will be down below. You can link to, and we will have links to contacting Amanda. I'm assuming. I yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Permission. Anyway, absolutely. I think that would be, uh, people would, you know, anyone that's curious, you seem to be a good contact to have, to have this discussion. So as always, you can email us at uh, our email, which is childfreegirls at gmail.com. You can, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel below, and you can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are also on LinkedIn and Pinterest, but the other three are the best way to engage with us. So thank you very much for watching, and until next time, see you later. Remember, folks, don't just fall into having babies. Think first. Ha, 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 ha.